Hello everyone. You're all very welcome to Science Gallery today for a very special event. We're going to be speaking to three people who have, for the last 20 years, been merging art and science in a brilliant and, and really unique way um, as part of the Science of Discworld series. So it's something that Science Gallery are really excited about and it's a project that we're, we're looking forward to hearing about. I, I guess to start off we'll talk about the fact that this is 20 years of the science of Discworld and you know it's a, it's a really unique way to to do a science of book. Usually you would expect a science of book to be um, you know go behind the story but this is supported by a fictional narrative that um, is just incredible and a really really nice way to explore the science behind something and it's another lovely way in which something that you know science gallery always tries to do give people fresh new ways into science so i think ian is going to start off the event and i'm going to talk as little as possible you'll be pleased to know um and i look forward to, to hearing more about the science of disc world thank you Good. I'll talk and run the computer and Jack and Terry will heckle um, and Why join in and take over. And welcome to the Dublin, the city of science of Discworld. How can there be a science of Discworld? Discworld runs on magic. Okay? So, this is one way to make a world. Has all the ingredients. This is the sensible way to run the world. <coughs> it's this world. It's flat, so things don't fall off. It's held up by four elephants, so that it doesn't fall. The elephants are held up by a turtle, so they don't fall. The turtle doesn't need to be held up, it's a turtle. It <laughs> swims through space. So it all makes sense. It has a sun, which goes sensibly round the disc once a day, like any reasonable son ought to. And of course, the elephants have to lift a leg, let it come by. And it's fairly close up, so the sun doesn't have to be incredibly hot. So it's much more energy efficient. And the oceans fall off the edge, because it's flat, but um, they're magically recycled, so that's OK. So it never runs out of ocean. People live on it, and they always have. As in any sensible, what's the point of having a world if you don't have people on it? And things happen because people want them to. This is called magic, or they happen because of the power of story. The story says they have to. This is called narrativium, narrative imperative. All of this means that everything makes sense. Yes, if things happen because something wants them to, if you start asking why did that happen, you have an obvious answer. So and so wanted it to. Or the story says it was going to. There is, however, another way to make a world. You recognise that one? This is the stupid way. <laughs> And the more you think about it, the more you realise just how stupid round world, as we like to call it, is. I mean, the first thing it's got wrong is it's round, which means things fall off. Or at least they would, except there's this mysterious force. Gravity keeps everything just about attached. I mean, it's not very well attached. You can jump up and down. Unaided human beings can get about six feet off the ground. This means the people on the bottom are upside down. It's so big that it looks flat. You see, if you're really stupid, you might think it is flat, and that would make it a much more sensible sort of world. It's not supported by anything. How silly. It swims through space of its own accord, but it's not a space-faring turtle. It's just a round sphere. It hasn't got any flippers. It's too dense to float doesn't make sense. It can't decide where to go, whereas a turtle knows exactly where it wants to go. So round world, as it makes its way blindly through the universe, keeps banging into things. <laughs> like that. <laughs> I mean, do you understand how improbable and silly our world is? It's got a sun, but it doesn't revolve around the disk, around the world. Instead, the world revolves around the sun. 
It's got it back to front. And it does it once a year, not once a day. So why does the sun rise and set? It doesn't. The planet spins. So if you're really, really stupid, you think the sun goes round and round and it rises and setting. Then you have to make the gravity sums work out. Now, I'm a mathematician. You do the sums. Like, the sun's gigantic, which means it's got to be a long, long way away, which means it can't be energy efficient. It has to be really, really hot. So there's all this... You're into nuclear fusion and quantum and all of these things just to make this fudged-up world work. This world, it works because people want it to. This one, it gets very, very mysterious. Okay? And it spins. Not quite like that, but <laughs> it's the best graphic I can manage. <laughs> now, some of it's quite clever. The oceans don't fall off the edge because it hasn't got an edge. This is one of the few advantages of a round world. But instead, the oceans fall upwards because they evaporate. So they get magically recycled as well. So round world never runs out of ocean either. Now, there's no narrative imperative, so it doesn't know which axis to spin about. And actually, it, the axis slowly changes. This is because round world isn't quite sure what it should be spinning about. But it's got a moon, and the moon helps to stabilise the axis. So now you've added yet another. In, if this was a science fiction story, you say, oh, come on, there can't be all of these different things all happening. You're inventing too much. It doesn't make any kind of sense. It's populated by people now. We have a lot of evidence in this room. But for 99.98% of its existence, there weren't any people. There were mostly blobs. You learn a lot about blobs in Science of Discworld 1. Things do sometimes happen now because people want them to, but it's not magic. It's called technology. Mostly things happen because of mysterious rules, which we call science, which run somewhere in the background. But they don't look like anything that human beings understand. They mostly look like these formulas over here. Schrodinger's equation, for those of you who recognise it or don't. So absolutely nothing on round world makes the slightest sense until you puzzle out these strange rules. So... Guess which of these two types of world we're living on? We know it's round world. So that was kind of how we got started on writing the Science of Discworld series. Yes, Terry can interject. What's the word I'm looking for? Is it privative? Privative, yes. 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 Uh, I think I was like looking... death and darkness. Yes, uh, I was talking with Jack and Ian one day because these guys, I have to say, are scientists that like science fiction and like to hang out at uh, conventions. Uh, yes. Quite a lot, especially. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned the wonderful word privative. Uh, it's when your mum uh, says close uh, the window, you're letting the cold in. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, or the spread of ignorance. Well, it, it, <laughs> it makes sense. The window uh, opens and it's colder inside. The cold must have come, come in. in. Yes. I did this world. I know how this works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And death, of course, is a primitive. That's right. But, uh, but yes, on round world, the heat's getting out, of course. Yes. So we wanted to compare and contrast these two types of world. This world running on magic narrative in, but not science. So how can you write the science of disc world? We started. Hmm? By me, we met in a Mongolian cafe, yeah. Yeah. restaurant. <laughs> and um, we were... Terry brought us... Terry had reconstructed a book that we wrote called Figments of Reality and had done a brilliant job and it made sense afterwards. It's quite a good book now. <laughs> and we, we, we had all the chapters, but we couldn't see the, the way they'd go. And Terry said, you do it like this. We did it like this. Um, we, we met him to give him a copy of the book. And he came along with the science of Star Trek. And we bloody wept. 
<laughs> it's horrible. It's all about if you want to go faster than light, it's tachyons, and here's the equation. And Terry said, I played in your world, why don't you play in my world, or something like that. Yeah. And we thought, well, we can't, because there isn't any science. Then we began talking about Earth and privatives and <laughs> one thing and another. And before you know it, we had science of Discworld. The unseen university wizards create our universe by mistake. And it makes absolute <laughs> sense. And it makes absolute sense, yes, absolutely. After all, uh, people say, why is there a second type of light in Discworld? Well, how else would you be able to see the darkness? Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes, uh, well... Yes. <laughs> it makes a sense where if you live in a primitive world, that's what happens. You talk of the spread of ignorance and, the, and death. Actually, I could say that the spread of ignorance is not a primitive. I feared you'd say that. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Think of Wessex for example, Essex, for example. That is the spread of ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> I fear so. All right, I give up, yes. All right. Yeah, but I know what you mean. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so somehow we, somehow the three of us, uh, and we all have different theories about how it actually happened, um, yeah. but we realised that it had to be the case that the Discworld events were genuine Discworld events, and the round world science was genuine round world science, and those are two different worlds, and they do not coexist. So how do you handle it? Terry makes them coexist. So from outside, round world is this spherical, TARDIS-like containment field, which is much bigger on the inside because it doesn't know how big it ought to be, because <laughs> there's no narrativium to tell it how big it ought to be. Uh, but from the outside, it looks like a sort of pearlescent football or a bubble. From the inside, it's our planet, our universe. And that meant Jack and I basically could add very big footnotes to Terry's story. Yeah. So Terry wrote a kind of 25, 30,000 word Discworld short story with Discworld characters, Discworld events, some of them happening in Round World, of course, but that's a Discworld construct from that point of view. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Terry was one of, it, one of his great achievements was single-handedly to revive the use of the footnote. <laughs> if you read even the earliest of the Discworld books, you will find footnotes. Yeah. I was writing academic books and my publishers were saying, you can't put footnotes in because they didn't actually have the technology to handle it. In. I mean, now you can do it. You do it in <laughs> Word, it has huge footnotes. Anyway, so Jack and I write very big footnotes, and they're not about Discworld at all. They're about round world science, real round world science, and sometimes... But looked at from outside. But looked yeah. at, looked out from these two points of view. You can look at things in terms of people making things happen and the sort of people-centred way of thinking, or you can look at it from the what are the underlying rules of the universe, and then it all gets very mysterious, but also rather interesting. Yes. So we could compare and contrast these two ways of thinking. So it's a lovely vehicle for talking not just about scientific facts. That's not really what science is about. I mean, it's, ni it's nice to have a... We're fairly sure that probably the Earth is round and so forth, but... Uh, it's not a list of facts, it's a way of thinking. And if you have a different way of thinking to contrast it with, and we could have done science and religion, and we did a chapter or two on that at times, but um, you can offend a lot of people if you <laughs> contrast. You can, you can, if, you can offend enough. both. You can have real fun and offend both. Uh, <laughs> but if it's science versus magic, it's a little easier for everybody to, to kind of get the point. So... So Unseen University became the great vehicle for us because of the wizards. And um, Terry privileged us. That's right. Mm. By you must... making us wizards. Indeed, indeed. Yes, you ended up 
Well, feeds in on that one, didn't you? Well, uh, <laughs> but you have, have to remember that, that for the purposes of the game, the um, the wizards actually create round world. Yes. You know, one of them finds some continuum lying around, stirs <laughs> it up a bit, and next thing you have a world. Well, you, don't, you actually, the dean puts his finger in. Well, that's and, right, yeah. uh, there was quite a small bang from the outside. <laughs> yeah. well, yes. there are, <laughs> and it really was started by that's an old man with a beard. Yes. 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 It started with an old man with a beard, that's right. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. In, um, as you know, in Unseen University, the health and safety thing runs like this. If it's unsafe and unhealthy, we'll give it a go. It's going to be very interesting. Yes. <laughs> So there we have the wizards holding up round world. OK, so then we had to actually decide what to put in our very big footnotes. <laughs> you know, we've got the structure, but then you still have to have content. So what sort of things should we talk about? Well, the obvious things to talk about, since it was about round world, was the shape of the planet. How, how do scientists know what shape the planet is? OK. And this is a story we all get in school. This is something. You don't actually have to be fantastically intelligent to figure out it isn't flat. Um, <laughs> and the ancient Greeks could do this. So Eratosthenes measured the distance from uh, Alexandria in the north of Egypt to what was then called Syene. It's now Aswan in the south. And he looked at the angle at which the sun was at midday. And in Aswan, it's directly overhead. In Alexandria, it was about seven degrees off the vertical, which is roughly one fiftieth of a circle. So Eratosthenes, being quite bright, said, well, I, I kind of know it's round, but I can work out how big it is now, because that means the distance from Ar Alexandria to Syene is one fiftieth of the circumference of the planet. How far is it from Alexandria to Syene? And the answer was something like 52 camel days. Yes. <laughs> he had to ask the, the uh, people who traded with the camel caravans and uh, find out how long it took. And then, well, a camel goes a certain amount per Ian. day. Um, Ian? Yes? Can I just interject something? A uh, question to you, sir. He kind of knew. It was round. Yes, the Greeks were already convinced it was round. What was convincing them? Okay, um, the, shadow the, of the, the shadow the of the earth on the moon in eclipses. So it wasn't just, I've got a funny feeling. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the Om story, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I yes. mean, the, the, the ancient Egyptians seem to have, th in some ways, thought it was square because you've got the four cardinal points. But if you live in Egypt, you think it's square because the Nile Chinese runs north-south well, and the sun comes Chinese up in the well. east and sets in the west. So Egypt has these natural axes and the whole of ancient Egypt revolved around this sort of natural coordinate system in which north, south, east and west are almost imposed upon the country. Yes. But the Greeks realised a whole pile of reasons. The other things like when a ship sails out to sea, you see the mast slowly disappearing beyond the horizon. And the Greeks were quite good at geometry. They thought, oh, that means it's curved. See? So the, the question for Eratosthenes was not, not actually what shape is it. He, he knew it was round. How big is it? That, that's a more interesting question. Um, so it is actually recorded that he got a figure of so many thousand stadia. And the stadium is a unit of distance. And the problem is nobody actually knows quite how long a stadium was. Yes. So the historian said, well, the Earth's the size it is. And he, so you can work backwards and you can work out what a stadium must have been. And then, of course, his result was amazingly accurate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it, it probably wasn't too bad. So we could talk about that kind of science, and we could mention, yeah, here's, here's the geometry of it for you, you see. And it's even got the camels. <laughs> it's a well in Syene. It's, uh, it is probably, um, no, it's, I'm not sure what it is in Alexandria, actually, some sort of monument. A couple of camels in between, and this is all you need to know. <laughs> there are still people who are not convinced. And uh, 
We're Show talking nothing. about that in SOG 4. The, no. We are going yes, to talk yes. about this in number four, yes, because the whole issue of intellectual property happen, rights for round worlds well, is going to, to come up. It's going to happen now, isn't it? Um, so. uh -huh. And that there are some opposing theories. Cyrus Teed, interesting gentleman, said, yes, it's round, but we're living on the inside. It's hollow. Yes. The sun's in the middle, and you have to do a certain amount of interesting machinations to make that actually Work. fit together. <laughs> But they're not so different. If you went back about 10 slides to when I was saying, well, round world, things will fall off the bottom. You've got to add gravity. You've got to have a moon. You've got to have other stuff. It's, um, it's at least arguable that the number of ingredients that Mr. Teed needed to make his hollow earth theory work is not outrageously different from what we need for the one that people actually believe. Um, but it does have... But you have problems. to be a mathematician to think like that, actually. Yeah, and yes. the problem is you can explain each bit individually, but when you put the whole explanation together, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. And, of course, now it's perfectly obvious what shape. It's basically a, a bowl cut in half. <laughs> um, except, of course, some of this could be fake. And, of course, Narrativium tells us that someone with a name like Cyrus Teed going to be a bit of a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does, doesn't it? Cyrus T. It, 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 yeah, you, can so... only, you can only put Firefly at the end of it. That's right. Yes. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> oh, dear. Mm. <laughs> this is how it went on. Yes. Through many a stir-fly. Yep. And so, one of the questions, can I interject? You, you, you can interject, Terry. Um, was me asking, what is a scientist? And we had a lot of fun with that. Oh, we did. Oh, we, we had... Yes. I can't remember which one it was in. I think it was uh, in number, number two. two. Yeah. Number two in the globe, which is by many ways the best one, I think. I think so, yeah. yeah well, it's yeah. the one... Where it had Shakespeare in it. Yeah, know? the first one we crammed too much in because we didn't know there was going to be a number two. In fact, Terry had told us there wasn't going to be a number two. Because number one was going to be so much fun that you could never... It's, you know, you shouldn't go back. And we couldn't put enough in it. I mean, it, it, it's grossly overfull. Yeah, it should have been two books. Yes. Anyway... Yeah. So, Two but yes. And more money. So Two by, more by money. <laughs> that's right. But, but by by number two, we we knew how to play the game, and we'd figured out that instead of fifty chapters with twenty five from Terry and twenty five from me and Jack, it should be about twelve or thirteen chapters from each of us. Yes. Um, mm. Slightly more extensive essays, and we we mapped it out. And in the middle was a bit where. The wizards figure out what science is, and then Jack and I tell, tell all the what readers really is. what science mm. is. Mm. That's right. Mm. Um, and we left those on the grounds. Those would be very easy to write, so we'll do everything else first. So we did everything else, and we came to that bit, and Terry said, OK, what is science, really? And Jack and I said, well, hmm, ah. <laughs> yes. and, and we discussed this, and... Uh, and eventually I started saying, I, I think what, what, what Terry latched onto, and he'll contradict me if this is false, but uh, was two points. One is that, I'll tell it this way, I had a PhD student who was a very bright Portuguese woman mathematician. There are lots of women mathematicians in Portugal. And she came to me one day and said, I've been reading this paper that you and a couple of other people wrote, and um, I think it's incomplete, she said. I said, oh, we made a mistake, did we? Oh, oh no, 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 but uh, you say such and such, and I've been reading this other paper which has a similar list, but they've got an extra one. And, I think you should add that to your list. You, you mean our list is missing one? Well, I think you should add that one. And eventually I got her to actually agree that we'd got it wrong. Yeah. And, I, and she was obviously a bit nervous telling me that we got it wrong. And I said, no, look, this is fantastic. You, you are now, you've actually earned your PhD at this That's point. Right. Yes. Because you've come and told me something that I didn't know already. Yes. And it's something, OK, it happens to be that we screwed up, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> this is not unusual. 
Um, of course I said, it isn't. but it's science. You, that's right. But you've got to do a little bit more than that. You've got to actually go to the United States, visit one of the other authors, talk to him about it as well, yeah. and figure out what we should have done. Right. Where did we go wrong? And what what is the correct answer? Because maybe we didn't just miss one, maybe we missed a whole pile when we were listing these mathematical structures. OK, so the point of this is the way you make your mark as a scientist is, by, is not by telling everyone else that you agree with them. It's by actually finding something where you disagree with them and then you prove you're right. Yeah. And scientists actually accept that. Not necessarily always as easily as my friend and I did. Um, there's a certain amount of argument about it. But in the end, when the evidence mounts up, at some point, the scientist who's got it wrong will say, oops, sorry, OK, you've convinced me I've got it wrong. So that was one thing. So that you should actually delight in proving other scientists wrong. Um, and then I, I said, I, I was talking about something totally different. I, I, I've been working on uh, animal movement. And I was telling Terry about experiments where they found out how insects moved their legs in what patterns by taking a little cylinder of metal, coating it in soot from a candle, and then spinning it underneath the insect. The insect sort of held in position on top of this thing. And as it spins, the insect moves its legs, and it makes little marks in the soot. And Terry said, hey, now we could really do something with that. Because <laughs> yes. I'd I also wonder, told him about the question of horse gates. <laughs> I wonder how many of you have read Science of This World uh, 2. Can you put your hands up? Quite oh, not... Uh, OK. okay. We're, we're telling you think most, most of you think... Think of the money we're going to get now. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the extra money we're going to get now. Obviously. Yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> so I'm ter- thinking about that too. Yeah. No, but seriously, if you'd all read it, and then Ian was telling you this, it clearly would, wouldn't be news to you, but it is well, news no, it, to three quarters of the It would actually, Jack, because it would be where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> right. They'd know what came out of it, but they wouldn't know what, how it arose. Yeah, so, so the ingredients were you make your mark by contradicting yes. your mentor... Unlike, let's say, an ancient Greek philosopher where you, you make your mark by proving that your mentor was absolutely correct, somebody like Aristotle. Mm-hmm. And in fact, Aristotle wrote some things about a horse trotting. And there was a question whether the trotting horse is completely off the ground. And Aristotle basically says it can't be because if it was, it would fall over. Yeah. Um, anyway, so Terry put all of this stuff together and ended up with a character who is a bit like Aristotle's research student, who is trying to prove his master is correct about the trotting horse. But instead of arguing deep philosophy, he does a rather crass thing, and he goes out and does an experiment to find out. And the experiment is like the insect experiment, but using a horse. (laughs) And they do everything. They move the horse across the sand. They move the sand past the horse. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, I won't give away the punchline, but Terry took these sort of two or three little bits of discussion, (laughs) turned it into this central chapter. And when we finished this, we looked at the result and said, you know, if we thought of that first, instead of assuming that chapter was going to be the easy one, the whole book would have been (laughs) completely different. Yeah. So it, would have made, it would have made a fine centrepiece to a different book. Mm. <laughs> it, but I, I was still saying, what is a scientist? You were. Mm. And, uh, well, and we, uh, I think one of the things we did, I think, that the, 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 I think we left the wizards to it. They, they were helping us at this particular time. Yes. And so they found out the names of some of the scientists. Yes. And they so, got Newton wrong. Well, uh, they turned up in, in Newton's laboratory in this period of his life, later in life, where he believed in effectively magic. Yes, well, alchemy. Mm. Well, that, that's alchemy, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yes. But I think we what? ended up with... Sorry. I think we ended up with... You, you are a scientist if other scientists 
okay. recognize you that are. you are. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes That's I think right. it's, it's a very difficult concept. I've had something over 20 graduate students, and all of them changed my mind uh, in, something, in some really rather serious connection. Each of them got their PhD, as it were, by changing the mind of their supervisor. And that's quite important. Yeah, so the idea for number two was basically that getting Newton and Shakespeare born was the important thing mm. to do. And, and the elves were interfering with Round World. And so Terry had a lot of fun. The, the, the Wizards of Unseen University yeah. tried to get Newton and Shakespeare born, and uh, this turns out to be rather and, and more telling, difficult. And telling uh, uh, Shakespeare the plot. Yes. <laughs> Something Sorry. which Doctor Who was happy to play your eyes a little bit later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we, 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 we pinched quite a bit of the plot from the reason I put up the... This slide was that that was where a lot of the inspiration came from. Um, and then, having, having come up with the, the problem is to get the right person born, we realised that for the third book, so for Science of Disworld 3, I'm moving on because I want to open this up for some discussion at some point. Where are we going? In here somewhere. Oh, yeah, here we go. So, Science of Disworld 3. It wasn't a case of getting the right person born. That happened. It was getting him to do the right thing. And let me quickly... Ah, yes. OK. So, Round World is in trouble again. The, the, the wizards look after it because it's a bit like a pet gerbil. They feel responsible for it. <laughs> they don't feel very responsible for it, but they don't like to see the, thing, the poor thing getting into a real muddle. So it's not the elves, something else is going on, but it's not, Roundwood isn't doing what it's supposed to do. And they know from the earlier books that it's heading for a big catastrophe and that people are going to have to be able to get off the planet using technology, but they're not heading in that direction anymore. And it turns out it's because in Victorian England, science and religion sort of cozied up to each other instead of having a ding-dong argument. And it was very nice and comfortable, and everyone felt great. You know, it's fantastic. Uh, you know, we all agree on everything. Um, but it didn't have quite the, give the intellectual stimulus to the creation of science and therefore technology. Yeah. And it was all to do with the Reverend Charles Darwin, who wrote a book about species, which everyone loved. It was a brilliant book. Um, cool. And it was called Theology of Species. <laughs> Theology. And that wasn't the book that stimulated the discussions that led to the science that eventually led to the humans or whoever it was getting off okay. round world in time to avoid the Great Ice Age, which killed them all off. So the wizards have to get him to write the origin rather than the ology. And so the whole book is about Darwin not writing this book. Now, I sent Jack a kind of summary of this plot when we were trying to work out what to put in the book. Because the way this works is it always starts out, when we get from book N to book N plus 1, it starts out just after book ends come out, and Terry says, that was great, and we're not going to do another one. That's right. <laughs> yes. It's much too much, you know, you just, you just cannot, cannot match that. Followed at some delay by, if we did do another one, what would it be about? Oh, yes. <laughs> Which is then a signal for Jack and me to put together scenario after scenario right. after scenario... To see and which Terry, ones don't uh, no, off. that's no good. No, don't like that. Don't. Oh, hang but it's on. got to have narrativium. <laughs> that's yes. right. It's got I mean, to have the, the, narrative. The, Dar the Darwin one was great. Yeah. Because we could take Darwin real history as a boy. Yeah. And follow him along, and see. And I, I, narrativia came to my aid again, because <laughs> all the way through Darwin's earlier life. 
the chances of there being not a young Darwin were turning up yes. and just missing him. Yeah, if you, if you read the any, real history. any of the biographies mm. of Darwin and you understand that the backdrop against which his life happened is this battle between the Wizards of Unseen University and <laughs> unknown dark forces yes. trying to get him to write the book that he actually did, The Origin of Species. You look at his life and you say, that's, I can, that's, that's the place where the wizards interfered. And then that's the place where the wizards interfered. He, because there were so many. Yeah, yeah, there's about six very obvious ones. He, he went to university, he studied theology, uh, among other things, he had to read a slightly subversive book, um, which is... Paley, Paley Natural, Theo yeah. Natural Theology. Natural Theology, which is about design in living creatures and how this proves the existence of God and so forth. And, and Darwin actually thought this was pretty good. And what he wanted to be was a country vicar. Because and to play with natural history, yeah. like country vicars mm. did. That's right. So, uh, but, but then he didn't do that. So the wizards obviously interfered at that point. And then when the job on the Beagle came up, yes. Darwin applied for it and didn't get it. Um, because somebody else yeah. got the job instead. And then soon after that, um, it, the, the, the person who, was, who had got the job, uh, his wife discovered it was a three-year job and said, you're not going on a ship for three years. It was actually five. Um, so suddenly the job came up again. Mm. So uh, Darwin's father said, you're not going to go on that ship. And then he paused and said, oh, unless yeah. some person of high standing advises me that you should go, which yeah. meant his uncle Josiah of the Wedgwood family. Mm. And Uncle Joss, this will be the making of the young man. Yeah. And so on. So, oh, and then Darwin was absolutely seasick. That's right. Yep. At the start of the voyage. And when they put in at the first island, it's quite clear he was going to jump ship and go home because it was such a wretched experience. But when they got there, there was a, a... smallpox. A, it was cholera, I think. Cholera. It was cholera. Yeah, there was yeah. a cholera outbreak, so he couldn't leave the ship. And by the time um, he got to the next possible stopping point, he... he he, well, he, he discovered, he, 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 he come up with a theory for the origin of um, uh, Island. Coral Islands. Coral Islands, yes. Uh, and, and he wanted to see some more of them. Right. And, and he, he found um, high shells on one of the islands and couldn't understand how they got there and was really puzzled by this. And that overcame his bloody seasickness. I can't <laughs> imagine how I'm desperately seasick myself. But he, he solved the seasickness problem by spending most of the voyage on land. Yes. <laughs> but, and, yeah, and remember that while on land, he was uh, doing dangerous things. He Very was ga dangerous. galloping horses and, you know, across the, the veldt and all that. Right. And being involved in several little wars. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yep. A, so, did, but did a can <laughs> cannonball pass through the rigging of their boat yes. at one point? Right. So he, he, this this is really the battle between good and e evil happening ha you know. all the time. <laughs> yeah. And it's a brilliant bloody book. You should read well, so <laughs> number three. Well, actually, it had me reading. Uh, I, uh, I, started, I went and read Origin of Species yes. for this. And I'd read it when I was a kid. It was the thing that turned me on. Mr. Lisa, uh, every now and again, in, a, in, a, in your life, probably, a school teacher is going to give you the book that did the job. Yeah. I remember reading through that, and I had, shortly afterwards, I had something which kept me in bed, I can't remember, and made me a slightly hallucinogenic. <laughs> um, and I read... Um, you haven't grown out of that, of course. No, and, 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 and so I read the book, uh, and... Yes, yes, it's probably stayed with me all this time. I'm yes. sure about that. Um, and I thought, this is, this, is this, is this is right. This is actually what it is. Um, and actually, now in my garden, which is quite large, we have a bank. It's Darwin's Bank. I, I, I'm trying at my best to do Darwin's Bank. And again, even in, in the... When, when that was even when I, when I was 
writing the bit we did at the end, uh, where the wizards are even then trying to make him see that the bank is there. We'll open up for questions. Mm. OK, I think looking at the time, um, we, st we still have somewhere between 10 and 25 minutes to go, depending on when we end. But mm. at some point, you will be allowed to escape. <laughs> um, but I th we have, yeah, we have some we have, gallery team members going yeah. through the mics. Yeah. If you have any mm. questions, just raise your hand. Yeah. And, and now it's probably a good time to mention as well that there won't be a book signing afterwards, but if you'd like to pick up any of the Science of Discworld copies, okay. they're available down the front. Don't mind doing. This. Well, have we got? Have, it's probably someone's going to tell me we haven't got enough time. Is that it? Um, well, I, 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 we'll stay tuned and we'll figure out if okay, there's yeah. a book signing. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> we'll, we'll do something. Um, but anyway, but yeah. uh, I think we had a, the most fun was on that. And the first and the first and the last. Well, uh, and third, yeah, the wait. middle one was the best, was the best one. Uh, yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> they're, they're all three pretty. Because good. the point is also. The two of them had to, ex had to um, explain everything to the dummy. Yes. And that made it more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this man knows more than anybody I know. Well, well... <laughs> yes, Call him a dummy, is it? Well, well, <laughs> he's totally wrong. But he can play the dummy. But it gave me... The, Beautiful. You see, it gave, <laughs> it gave me the wonderful things, like a rinse wind actually, uh, actually on our planet. Yes. And think, oh dear, you know, because it goes through catastrophes. Oh dear. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the sky is burning again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, any questions? We'll throw it over. Nobody discussion. <laughs> if we're not having any silence. questions, should I say something about this Science of Disc World 4? Oh, yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> Well, we're kind of in the middle of Science of Discworld 4, and we've got a, a kind of recurring theme, which is from Greg Benford, a uh, well-known science fictionist and physicist, who suggested that there are two ways of looking at the world. One way is to see it as people-centered. That is to say, the important things are all about people. And God created the world and created it for people, and animals are there to use, and the earth is there to use, and so on. But you needn't believe in God and have that attitude. You could still have the attitude that men talk to many economists, and they will believe that the world rotates around economics and people. Alternatively, you may believe that the people are an entirely, well, pretty nearly irrelevant speck on the outside of a tiny little ball of dust um, going in a totally insignificant solar system in a not very important galaxy among 200 billion galaxies. And that really, such importance as we attach to ourselves is given to us within a universal context. And it's very cute to be able to get one side and the other side of this argument, to, to start parochial with people or to start universal. And it doesn't sound like that when we do it, <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> but um, we, we have a nice lot of tricks that come from that. Any questions now? <laughs> yes, we have one there. No, there are microphones. There, there, yeah, there, there are roving microphones. Um, yeah, so this is totally unrelated to the science of this world, but I'm sure a lot of people are wondering it. Um, is there going to be any more from Vimes and the Watch? Ah. <laughs> well, snuff was pretty good, and I've got to leave it some time before I do another one because otherwise I'm just doing police procedurals all the time. <laughs> uh, if there was quite a few more of me, that would be rather helpful. Uh, at the moment, um, I've got to think about this. I've got to think because, um, God help us, 
uh, the long earth has gone to number one. And we were hoping that we were going to do a sequel, and now we most definitely are. <laughs> right. So I'm going to have to bang on with that. Um, and these guys want something done. And, uh, you know, sometimes I have to sleep, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I like doing it, but you can get... I mean, uh, Jack and I were, were, were um, commiserating about being old men recently. Uh, it, and... It, it, I'm a lot older than him. Yeah. Um, yes, but you haven't got Alzheimer's. No. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. mine, yes. mine is very slow, sure. and you can't, can't really notice it unless I tell you. But uh, um, once you get over 60, you start getting tired a little more easily. I believe that. Um, and the amount <laughs> that you've done, though, the amount... Well, I want to do it. Done. My attitude is you can't die if you have a book in progress. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not allowed. Colin believes that. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I'll laugh to Robert Jordan. Well, the trouble is you've now gone from... Um, you had a universe of your own, which most of us don't. Now you've got two of them. <laughs> well, one of them is part shared, you know? Yeah, but, yes. <laughs> but that's not one half a, a half. universe. It's not half a universe you have, it's another whole universe. Well, yeah. uh, yeah, yes, no, even a, a whole number of universes. W when is the long disc world going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that would get... There's only so many climbs go, uh, uh, that they, I can put in. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think we have uh, another question up the back. How are you doing? I was just wondering, in the event that humanity escapes round world in this, uh, this cataclysmic scenario, does, does the space around the world start expanding? Does, do, does space start appearing because they believe that they're going into space, or do they go and live on the desk in the, in the <laughs> laboratory that they're in? Okay, One the, of the things I think I'd like to say yeah. is that it's, if we take, it's because we take the human view, that's human-centric, it's because well, within the lifetime of your grandchildren, at least, there will be great wars over everything. Because we are running out of so many things. And we are rather stupid. We're never, ever going to have a world, a world government. Um, the USA will, will never agree, would it? <laughs> well, nor would China. I mean, I'm mm. being serious about this. Yeah, we don't think as a species. We think as... Of individuals. Citizens, of mostly, or yeah. individuals. And we're gra it's, ta it's taken us a very long time. I've once heard, oh, quite a few years ago, an old lady saying well, she wasn't going to use this washing powder because of the planet. And up until that point, because she, was, she my, was my grandmother, um, I thought, she's never really thought she's been on the planet. <laughs> Isn't it? She's never needed to bother about it. But now, uh, some washing up powder, which apparently wasn't any good you know, for the environment. Full of phosphate. Yeah, phosphate, probably, um, yeah. And suddenly that she was going to save the planet by not using it. But um, we are using up resources. Those resources... That we are warming things up far too much. Yes, and some, uh, some of those resources will come back again, but you're going to have to wait for absolute mi millennia when it comes back. Uh, and you won't like the way it comes back because that's going to be awfully hot. Yeah. Um, and we really are not doing that much about it. This, to talk about the time when your lady was using the right detergent, the, I'm, I'm, I think it's very cute that Earth used to mean soil, and now Earth means the planet. And, it's, it was, and it happened in my lifetime, that change of usage. You've just designed Science of This World 5. <laughs> <laughs> I think Nicola has a question uh, uh, here. Yeah, the, oh, sorry. Uh, just a, a quick answer to, the, to that question. Um, the, the fiction that we have is that what happens inside round world from the round world point of view is what we think is happening in this universe today. So, yes, so it is expanding inside. Not on the outside, of course. It, it, it might well be expanding because when 
the original finger went in and it sparked off the <laughs> explosion. That left some characteristics. We haven't really explored that. But, um, yeah, everything that's happening inside should look like what, you know, what, what is really happening, if that makes sense. I mean, um, there is... It, the expansion of the universe and the acceleration of the expansion are pretty widely believed by cosmologists and indeed by non-cosmologists these days. There's good evidence for that. A lot of the explanations for that are not greatly believed by anybody yes. um, and are certainly very provisional. So I don't know what's happening inside Round World, but I know what the scientists of Round World think is happening inside Round World. Yeah. Right. And that's the story we tell in that part of the book. Nicola? Um, as a, uh, I'm utterly delighted to hear that Long Earth is going to be followed by Long Earth 2. That's going to be brilliant. Um, I was oh, just... Longer um, Earth. <laughs> longer Earth, yes, or Long Earth <laughs> in another direction. Um, but I was just th thinking, Terry, if, you're, if you were so turned on by the origin of species, as, even as a child, as a boy, um, what led you not to go and become a zoologist or a biologist rather than a writer? Or possibly a zoologist, biologist first and then a writer? Too much science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ladies and gentlemen, it will take control of your daughters and sons. Mostly, <laughs> mostly your sons, but sometimes your daughters. Um, uh, and, I mean, I have to tell you, uh, it's a, a, secret, a very big secret. Um, I talk to my computer, I can. Uh, talking point and um, a dragon dictate together with a little bit of treat, treating make it very easy for me to do the, my first draft. Um, but I keep... I get kind of annoyed at the, 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 the technology people. Com we've had computers for a very, very long time. And they have been very, very cheap. Uh, they're getting cheaper and cheaper. So that incredibly powerful computers, I would have actually killed my grandmother to get. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, she was old anyway, you know. <laughs> cre creaking door, all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I've got, I've got more computing power in my office than the whole world had actually probably not that long ago. Yes, yes. And yet, we aren't, do make it, we aren't doing... An You're not doing miracles. But it's, doing, it's, it's computing games, porn, um, uh, social media and all kind of other stuff is happening. There's, there's so much other stuff. For example, um, because I nagged at the, at the talking point people, now... Um, I finish my work, I just say to the open air, save work, or save work and shut down, oh. or save work and restart, or something like that. We're actually fitting it up, so now that when I actually go into my office in the morning, the computer will line up but start up, ex even when I'm starting turning the key in the lock, and so the ratted thing will actually come up just as I get there. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> and I also... And I've, you know, I want the computer to talk back to me. It's possible. Yeah. It's quite easy, too. To, um, we are not... We're, we're, we're taking the technological path, but we're not really using much technology. Yes. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not going to the places in science fiction where we bloody well ought to be going. <laughs> That's but the thing. The spaceship ought... The spaceship has Eliza and there, and you get <laughs> on board. You say, right, Eliza, do everything. But that, um, that should, right, I, mean, I can, because right, my next. computer is attuned to me, I, I can actually talk to it from anywhere. But uh, you need an awful lot of other stuff to make real things happen. But what, is, what does cheer me up is now there are people around. Uh, uh, there was a little while ago, it wasn't too, too long ago, there was one stupid woman on... on she uh, was um, an actress, and she said, I hate space. What has space done for us? And I was going, Well, <laughs> <laughs> like everything. Like that now, these days, if you have something the size of what, an old fashioned cigarette pack, you never ever need to get lost anywhere. That's longitude. 
in, mm. a, in a nutshell. Yeah. All these things. You can phone anyone else in the world. Arthur C. Clarke actually said before 2001 came out that by the time it came out, it might be possible with a large enough briefcase to be able to phone someone with a large enough briefcase on the other side of the world. Yes. By the time, by the time it turned up, everyone had mobile phones. <laughs> well, yes, and absolutely. It, and it's going very fast. And you can now do so many things. You get on the social media. You're getting. We, act, we actually. It's going the wrong way, though. Well, I don't <laughs> know. I don't know. Uh, we are. We were hearing some of the things that Larry, Larry Niven was talking about. Flash crowds. Mm. Yes, absolutely yes. flash crowds. Yes. Um, they're starting and, to happen. Real, real science fiction ideas are coming into place. There was a whole lot of uh, people in Trafalgar Square when we were launching the Long Earth because you know, we just did it over the air. Uh, we could be doing so much with the stuff, but we, we don't. We seem to... It, it's now coming back into a kind of basic form of entertainment and stopping right there. And the rest of it is left to the people that just use it for doing the typing. <laughs> well, you know, the That's same a bit thing of a happened to Marconi. Mm -hmm. He wanted records to be for recording the last words of important people. And he didn't want it to be used for music at all. You know about Much that. too frivolous. Much yes. too frivolous, yes. He took in the money, all right. But okay, so, he, um, so you, you walk into the deathbed with the recording device and a gun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, yes. <laughs> this won't hurt a bit. Yes. Mm. We have another question from the audience. Um, you were saying about the possible fourth book. Do you think it's ever possible to marry the two, two viewpoints of someone's egocentric view and because the only other view we have the world is of the world excluding me we always talk about the people or the world but it never includes yourself is there any way to marry that those two points I think that's a very interesting question because it is um, as a human being if you adopt exclusively either of those two ways of thinking you're in trouble yeah. <laughs> neither of them does the whole job and some way of integrating integrating them uh, yeah. Jack, or alternating them yeah Jack and I have this we, we, we use the word complicity for this kind of thing um, not quite in the usual dictionary way but complicity is where two in, two things come together and they don't just interact with each other but they keep Changing each the interaction other. goes on and they mm. keep changing each other and what emerges from them is actually it transcends them both and it would be fantastic if it were possible to do that with those two ways of thinking because both have merits one of the things we don't do is say oh no this the sort of the science one is good and the other one isn't no yeah. they both have merits in their own in, in you know in the right circumstances the important thing is to recognise the distinction, which is perhaps the first tiny step. At least once you know they're different, you stop saying there's only one way to think about these yes. things. And yes. so, uh, you know, uh, I don't think we're there yet. It's this is um, this, this is the uh, we were discussing this last night. The, you, you said it was John Brunner. We, we are halfway between ape and human. Yes. Well, we told, our, we told ourselves that we are homo sapiens. Yeah. No one ever came down with a stamp no. and yes, said homo right. sapiens. Yes, that's well, right. in the second book, we say we're Pan Narans, the mm. storytelling ape, and we make a good story <laughs> about that. But it's a story we want to see, not the story of what is true. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what is true. I had a... Well, I'm... Reliving an experience I had when I was about 15, when my grandfather took me into his study to give me a really serious talking to, because I had spent 50 pounds on a pair of angelfish, which were very rare then. I thought I was going to breed them, and one died. <laughs> and 50 pounds was a lot of money. My, money was, my mother was earning two pounds a week as a machinist. 
50 pounds was a lot of money. And I had spent this, and then I bought another one. And my grandfather took me in to his study, and he said something which I've always remembered since for being silly biology, but it's actually desperately deep. He said, Jackie, are you going to be a queen bee or a wasp? <laughs> now, it's bloody silly biology. But what he meant was, were you going to have the big view or the little view? Do you see that? And at the time, I was trained to be a rabbi. And I'd just given up. I'd just read Spinoza and felt that being a rabbi wasn't big enough for me, in, in a way. And I bred the angel fish and made a lot of money out of them and became a queen bee and not a wasp in that sense. But I had always remembered it as being a silly little phrase. Are you going to be a queen bee or a wasp? And you, we got giggles around the audience because the, his biology is crap. <laughs> but the central thought there is the same one as, um, oh, what's his bloody name? John Brenner. John, well, John Brenner. We reckoned. Or a uh, oh. physicist. Uh, Gregory Benford. Gregory Benford. Yeah. It's a universal or parochial view. I think we have a few more questions. We'll mm -hmm. just take this one from the front first. Oh, yes. Hi, my question is sort of an observational question on what you were saying about what defines a scientist. Now, if you think about it in a strange way, and I know this sounds strange, but isn't a scientist a person who does something completely unnecessary to prove something is necessary? <laughs> Scientists don't prove anything. They never, never prove something. But well, they like to think mm, they have. But they, well, they think they do. Um, Sometimes. There are forms of words which are honoured in the breach as much as in okay, the, yes. the observance. But, um, Is this the difference between mathematics and biology now that we're... Ah, <laughs> well, Jack, Jack and I spent years coming to, to terms with that. <laughs> um, that we, well, see, mathematics and biology, certainly if you go back to the 19, late 1980s, 1990 or so, which is when we met, um, these were subjects that did not actually get on with each other terribly okay. well. They still don't get on fantastically well, but they get on a lot better than they did, and the younger biologists particularly are um, much more prepared to tolerate mathematicians and mathematical thinking, uh, even in biology. Oh, yeah. um, but Jack phoned me up out of the blue. We'd never met, um, because he'd read Does God Play Dice and was interested in chaos, but couldn't see how the mathematics of chaos could work if living creatures were organised. And he said, could he, could he come and talk to me about it? And we went to the pub for lunch, and four hours later we were still sitting in the pub, talking away. And what we discovered was that although on the points of detail, mathematicians and biologists seem to have completely different views of almost everything, there, there were some more general questions, questions mm. on which, where we had to identical experiences and very similar yeah. views. I mean, it's simple one being, what do you do if you've got a PhD student who doesn't seem to grasp that they're supposed to be original? Um, <laughs> you know, this happens in maths and it happens in biology. Yeah. And there were sort of more significant versions of the same thing. So we realised that on the right level, most of the differences we thought were there Kind of disappeared. They evaporated in yeah. that four hours. They evaporated. We we produced a paper in that four hours, and the embryo of our book, Collapse of Chaos, and um, we had different stances, but we both thought the same questions were important. It was a very, it was the most interesting four hours of my life, really. <laughs> yeah. This time for one last question, if anyone wants to. Have a go. No pressure, it's just the last one. <laughs> um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And in round world, according to the science of Discord, we eventually get in our little tin cans and fly away. Would you ever look at the science of Discworld from the other direction? The round world scientists finding the wizards and 
using technology to try to determine magic? Well, Greg Benford, the same Greg Benford, yeah. said, if it isn't like magic, it's not sufficiently advanced. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, that's right, you turn on a light, which is, which is magic. It's yeah, an advanced for, yeah, technology. For most people in the world, <laughs> that's magic. Oh, you wrote the piece, then? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, that. All right. Magic. Look, magic is real. It's around us all the time. It's mostly called technology. When I bought a Rambler car, when I went to the States in 1963, there was a bit of magic there. Up till then, I had a Rover at home, and I used to have to put a heater under the... In cold weather, I put a heater under the engine, pulled out the choke, retarded the ignition and then pulled the starter to get to start in the winter. And it took a hell of a lot to get to start. There was a piece of magic in the Rambler car. It was a note written down, a spell, cold start. And you pulled it, and a minute later, the car engine started. All right, that was the spell. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, No, just get in and start it. Yes. <laughs> it's even, yes, it's an even better spell now. Yes, it's an invisible spell now. Once you've got humans in round world, they start to turn it into disc world. And of course, this is why the disc world series makes so much sense to the inhabitants of round world. <laughs> I had to be the one. I, I think everyone here would agree with me that I could sit here and listen all day to this conversation. It's been incredible to have the three of you here at Science Gallery. And I, for one, am very excited about Science of Discworld 4. Ladies and gentlemen, please I welcome... I better write the bloody thing now. <laughs> 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 please join me in thanking everyone. Thank you.